companies don't get to be household names without taking a few risks along the way. As an entrepreneur, if you don't make a mistake, you don't make anything. Even the most successful marketeers, designers and executives sometimes slip up. And when they do, it can be on a monumental scale. There's a massive error of epic proportions. Epic proportions. In this series, the people who call the shops inside some of the world's best-known companies reveal how plans that seemed like a good idea at the time turned into commercial catastrophes. I didn't see that coming at all. It took me about seven years to get back on my feet. Tonight, they're inside accounts of the marketing misjudgments that cost millions. It was a very strong brand, but also it was a very big screw-up. Bungling public relations at the world's coolest company. You can never blame the customer. Nothing is ever their fault. The crazy sales promotion that brought a trusted brand to its knees. The reality was you know, far more unbelievable than, than fiction could have been. And Britain's business superstars explain how to survive a corporate calamity and bounce back stronger than ever. We all make mistakes. Some are just a bit bigger than others. Tonight, I'm exploring the excruciating fallout that occurs when companies get their marketing, advertising and public relations badly wrong, upsetting the people who matter most, the customers. First up, the soft drink that had an unusual side effect. Nutritious or delicious? Do we pick the one that tastes good or the one that is good for us? It's one of life's great dilemmas. Which is where the marketing folks come in, because their job is to spot when the consumer has a dilemma or a problem and to offer a solution. But only if they actually have a solution. It doesn't pay to oversell a product, particularly not to parents worried about their children's health. It's a point made by the story of Sunny Delight. It had one of the most successful product launches ever, pitched to parents as a healthy-looking juice drink that kids would love as much as a cola. But it suffered a sensational fall from grace when its makers were accused of tricking parents and even turning a child orange. Consumer giant Procter & Gamble has long been famous for washing up liquid and nappies. But in 1996, it made its first foray into Britain's lucrative soft drinks market. Competing with Coca-Cola and Pepsi was always going to be a challenge. So P&G enlisted the help of advertising gurus Saatchi and Saatchi. Sunny Delight was an opportunity for us not only to create a great market in the UK, but also potentially to build this into a global brand. Sunny Delight was already selling well in the US, so Saatchi and Saatchi tweaked the clever American marketing to sell it in the UK. It was a really stonking launch. It was very, very well thought out. But I think the thing that surprised us most, or certainly me most, was the fact that they managed to get it into the chilled cabinet. P&G's research had shown that customers liked the idea of freshness that the chilled bottle suggested. What's interesting about fresh is that it tends to be equated in consumers' minds with healthy. And, of course, the holy grail, as far as mothers are concerned, is to find drinks for their children that have a combination of healthiness, but also they're appealing to that age group. On the surface, Sunny Delight seemed to be the ideal solution to that problem. As stores stacked their chiller cabinets with the drink, a £10 million ad campaign showed thirsty children reaching for the distinctive orange bottles. There was a really quite extraordinary call to action commercial created. It was kids running in from playing outdoor pursuits, hot, sweaty, thirsty. Oh, he's back. They're all back. Can we get a drink? Go on. Opening the fridge door, and I think the shop then came out of the fridge, and they were grabbing this, this, this bright, 
fluorescent orange. Garish bottle. Got orange juice, cola, some purple stuff, and this new Sunny Delight. Opening it, chucking it all in, and then quenching their thirst. It was very, very powerful, and kids wanted it. So nice. Right. Brilliant. Oh. That's the last of it. No, it isn't. This is all right, New Sunny Delight. The great stuff kids go for. The real power of advertising moment. Within four months, Sunny Delight was the nation's third best-selling soft drink. Supermarkets doubled, then tripled their orders. It suddenly became one of the most successful grocery launches of all time. The, the sales took off so fast that our problem within the first few months of launch was about trying to reduce demand for it, not increase demand. We couldn't make the stuff fast enough. It was the most extraordinary thing to see. Everyone wrote about it. It was on television. It was even on the national news. It genuinely was a marketing phenomenon. In 1999, P&G sold over 200 million bottles of Sunny Delight. People began to ask if it could knock a certain fizzy drink off its sugary throne. Coca-Cola was kind of an unassailable number one, some way ahead of any other um, drink that was there. But what happened very fast was that all of a sudden Sunny Delight seemed to be hot on its heels. It was very much one of the top ten beverage brands in the UK. Then it became one of the top five. And the idea that Coca-Cola could potentially be toppled as the UK's favourite soft drink took hold. Procter and Gamble, it seemed, had discovered the impossible, a wholesome drink that children preferred to Coke. Until, well, the Food Commission urged parents to read the label. It turned out that Sunny Delight wasn't full of great stuff at all. Parents began to ask, is this really juice? It was about 5% juice, which of course means 95% other stuff. And the other stuff, obviously, mainly water. But there were things in there like colourings, flavourings, vegetable oil, which is one that gives you a kind of mouthfeel of drinking something with a more juicy content. In the trade, it's called organoleptic properties, which sounds terribly posh. There was also quite a lot of sugar. You couldn't see that from the label, especially if you were a parent trying to read that label, because it was declared as carbohydrate, and that's the technical term for sugars in a product. We worked out that that was a roughly equivalent kind of product to a cola, and we wanted to let parents know that. Horrified parents began to desert the brand. It imploded the whole promise. Uh, and I think there were literally hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of mums up and down the country suddenly realising that their bubble had burst and that this mysterious and magical product was actually not juice. Brand managers battled to regain Sunny Delight's healthy glow, but nothing could prepare them for what was about to come. Saatchi and Saatchi had been planning a fun new advert for Christmas. We'd taken the same sort of structure that we had in our normal ads, but in this case, it wasn't some kids, it was a snowman. <laughs> the ad was launched as the school holidays began, but Sunny Delight's makers were about to receive an unwanted Christmas present. The makers of Sunny Delight, one of Britain's top-selling soft drinks, have admitted that too much of it can turn children's skin yellow. A young Sunny Delight drinker from Wales had been rushed to hospital, suffering from an unusual temporary side effect. She was a sweet little girl of around four, and uh, just like any other young girl, except that her skin had a certain colour to it. Any parents trying to imagine what shade she had turned needed only to watch to the end of the advert. Sunny Delight, the great stuff kids go for. The mother told me that she had worked out that the child was occasionally drinking uh, 1 to 1 1.5 litres of Sunny Delight a day. I remember being at home at Christmas time, opening up the newspaper, looking at that story illustrated with the ad we had just made with the snowman turning orange, and it was one of those moments, you know, my, my mouth went a little bit dry, my heart started beating a bit faster, my stomach lapped a little bit. Because at that point, I knew something really bad's happened here. I don't like the look of it. 
the worst that can happen with any brand, and of course in business in general, is that you hurt your consumers in any way. Making children turn orange, I mean, it's difficult to imagine a more difficult kind of story to manage. You've got a product that is bright orange and contains all kinds of things that are making it bright orange, and then the kid goes orange while you drink it. You can see that that's the kind of image that sticks with people. It ain't going to go away. By 2001, sales had halved and Sunny Delight had fallen from near the top of the bestseller list to a lowly number 42. I hung on to it, grim-faced, desperately hoping that I would be able to come up with some kind of idea that would turn it around. But the sales just kept on going down and there really wasn't too much we could do. You can hype anything, you can make everything fantastic, but you can't hype a poor product. Canny advertisers know that, yes, you can fool people for a while, you can enjoy booming sales for a year or two, but you're in business for the long term, and in the long term, you're bound to be rumbled, as Sunny Delight was. It wasn't what they had initially thought it was, the 100% juice product, completely, entirely healthy and sugar-free. Of course, none of those things were ever things that we'd ever claimed about it or ever indeed intended to claim. You can't dissect it and say one thing didn't lead to another, they did. Your consumers, or indeed your opinion formers, will pick up their cues and clues about your brand from a whole range of sources. So where is it in the supermarket? What's the packaging like? Or who's advertising it? All these things are important to people's impressions about your brand. And of course, you use that power of impressions at your peril. Perhaps Sunny Delight was a victim of its own success. The higher our expectations of a product, the further it has to fall in our estimation deliver. And that's especially true of products aimed at children. We had never thought that this was going to be quite so, you know, emblematic for the health of the nation's children. And still I look back on it today and just think, it was just an orange soft drink, wasn't it? Of course, Sunny Delight is hardly the only case of brand managers pushing the boat out a little far. Such is the pressure on advertisers to accentuate the positive, it's perhaps not surprising they get carried away every now and again. Like in this DFS commercial, condemned by the Advertising Standards Authority for making the people look small in order to make the sofas look big. And other drinks have also stumbled in the UK, in 2004, customers felt misled when Dasani water turned out to be somewhat less natural than they assumed. It was, in fact, treated tap water from Sidka. Despite a star-studded rebrand, P&G finally decided to sell off the Sunny Delight name. Today's product has a new recipe with a higher juice content, but its sales are just 4% of what they once were. Used cleverly, sales promotions can be a smart way to boost flagging market share or clear out excess stock. But getting promotions wrong can be disastrous for your bottom line and your brand, no matter how famous it is. Hoover is the brand that entered the English vocabulary, the word synonymous with vacuuming. Unfortunately, since the 1990s, it's also been inextricably linked to a sales promotion catastrophe. The free flight fiasco. Who would have thought that two free air tickets could bring one of Britain's biggest brands to its knees? With multi-million pound losses, a full-scale customer revolt and even a bizarre carjacking incident. Not Hoover. In the early 90s, Hoover's dominance of the British home cleaning market was under threat, as customers turned to newer, more fashionable brands for their electrical goods. Hoover Europe was facing severe problems that had lost a lot of money in the first nine months of the year, so pressure were on the management to do better and to shift a lot of the stock that was being piled up in warehouses. You either take the decision to scrap, which could be very, very expensive,
or you, you have some mechanism for getting a promotion going which increases the volume of sales. Hoover had a history of using promotions to boost business. What's in this Hoovermatic for you? A free Hoover...